Welcome to Bloomer Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Markets rebounded today from the biggest drop in three months. This amid lingering concerns about rising unemployment and a resurgence of COVID-19 in different parts of the country. The CDC saying cities and states should be prepared to resume lockdowns if cases surge dramatically. Meantime, social networks continuing to fight misinformation about the disease and more leading into the U.S. election. Twitter now says it's shut down 32,000 accounts tied to China, Russia and Turkey for manipulating the platform. This a day after Vice President Joe Biden called out Facebook for failing to control misinformation and not taking a stand on political speech, a critique echoed by many who watch the social network. The company spends a lot of time uh, outlining uh, standards, they call them community standards, uh, that they're supposed to enforce against uh, all of their users. And then when one particular user uh, comes along, who happens to uh, send his posts uh, from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, there seems to be a, a very different standard. In a lot of ways, Facebook is too big to fix right now. Facebook has uh, uh, 2.5 billion users around the world uh, constantly posting in more than 100 languages. That's a system that's too big to govern. You have one young white man who has one experience in this life, who has the control of billions of people, like what they see and what they view, it is wrong. And I don't know if he's drunk with power or if he's simply uh, uh, just in a bubble. Joining us now, someone else who has an opinion about this, and that is Roger McNamee, co-founder of Elevation Partners and author of Zucked, waking up to the Facebook catastrophe. Roger, I just got to get your temperature right now. There's been so much happening day to day about Facebook over the last couple of weeks. Where are you right now on this? Well, Emily, I think what we're looking at here is the recognition now much more broadly among policymakers and users and journalists that the business model of internet platforms, and I'm speaking here really about Facebook and Instagram, but also about YouTube and Twitter, that the business model of those things is based on monopolizing our attention. And the things they do to grab our attention provoke our emotions. They consciously use algorithms to amplify the most engaging content. That turns out to be hate speech, disinformation, and conspiracy theories, which are just terrible for society. And what we're seeing now, because of the confluence of the general election primary season, the pandemic, the economic collapse, and now all the protests going on, there's so much of that that's being magnified and exacerbated by Facebook, by YouTube, by Instagram, by Twitter, that the whole country understands that this is a really, really serious issue, and we have to get on it. Now, between Biden jumping in on this uh, on Facebook and President Trump taking an opposite tact with the executive order, Facebook is now going to be a big flashpoint in the U.S. election. I mean, how do you expect this to play out? I, Emily, it's anybody's guess. Facebook has taken a major risk here because they have altered their terms of service to protect the privileges of the president for advertising in the campaign, right? They used to have a rule that said you couldn't lie in a political ad. And President Trump did some incredibly dis, uh, essentially dishonest things that would have been Ill illegal in any advertising context. He had offers that, you know, said you must reply by midnight, which were done every single day for weeks. And Facebook, rather than pull those ads down, changed its terms of service to make those kinds of ads okay. And it's done a whole bunch of other things that have made it really clear that they're lined up on Team Trump. And obviously, if the election goes the other way, Facebook will stand alone in having made that very visible move. And if you're an investor, you know that's a kind of risk you don't see in any of the other internet platforms, even though they're doing most of the same kinds of things. So do you believe they're taking these stands because they believe President Trump is going to be reelected? I have no idea why they're doing it other than if you're an internet platform on the scale of YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, you have to align with power. You can never get crosswise with the government of any country in which you operate. And in countries which are dominated by authoritarians, so think here about Myanmar or Cambodia or Brazil, they have to align with the authoritarian, which means they're going to be using their technology to manipulate and control the population. 
And that is the sort of thing that in the United States, President Trump would like to do. And so they have, unlike the other platforms, they've done it that in an undisguised way. And I think that makes them vulnerable. I think Mark is very fixated on power. I think he really has a vision that his platform is going to replace governments in many contexts. I think Google has the same vision, but they're much more subtle about how they implement it. And, you know, I just think Mark has put himself in this position where he's going to be the target of attention throughout this campaign. And then if President Trump wins, I don't know what loyalty he's going to show them. If President Trump loses, I think the other side's going to rightly look at Facebook as having, you know, not been an even-handed player in the electoral process. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there, Roger. If Biden wins, where does that leave Facebook? Well, uh, presumably, Biden will treat Facebook fairly, which is they're going to look at the, what Facebook does. And presumably, they're going to look at every platform and recognize that the business model of these platforms, the use of algorithms to amplify engaging content, is a source of huge harm. I mean, look at how much disinformation there has been around the pandemic. How is it that in the United States, we cannot treat public health as something that is shared by all of us? How is it that masks and social distancing became part of the culture war? The answer is disinformation spread over Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. That's how it happened. And if you look at the, uh, the rise of the quarantine resistance movement, all of that was organized and executed on social media platforms. And the key point here is I'm a real believer in free speech. I do not want to prevent people from sharing their personal ideas. What I want to prevent is the amplification of harmful ideas disproportionately by these platforms for their own profits. And that's where the problem lies. Again, I would let everybody speak, but this notion that they're going to take stuff that scares people or makes them outraged and give that this big juicing through the algorithms, that's a really, really harmful thing. And I think for investors, we're really in a very awkward place here because the market right now is telling us everything's fine, that you know President Trump's going to get reelected, all these platforms are going to sail merrily through this. But the civil unrest that's going on now is changing the culture before our eyes. And it may not be acceptable for corporations to do the kinds of things that internet platforms have taken for granted and that have made them so profitable. And that day of reckoning, if it comes, is going to be very, very serious. I, but, you know, how do you put a probability on that, Emily? I mean, we're still five months out from the election. So if you're in favor of freedom of speech, what do you think Facebook should have done about the president's tweet suggesting that looters be shot? We know the stance uh, that Facebook took. They did nothing. Twitter, on the other hand, flagged the tweet for violating policies, hid it behind a warning. What should Facebook have done? Well, Facebook should have done something like that. To be clear, Twitter waited until now to do that for the first time. I am really happy they did it. I think it was courageous because... Trump has been so good for Twitter's business that the notion that, you know, that Twitter would do anything to slow him down, that required courage. Remember, that was a public safety warning they put on the shooters and looters tweet, right? Because it was threatening violence. It was encouraging violence. And that, it seems to me, is not a free speech issue at all. That's the equivalent of screaming fire in a crowded theater. And these platforms... The whole issue here is not that they let everything fly. They actually make lots of editing choices. They make lots of, you know, Facebook will allow a male nipple, but not a female nipple. There are all kinds of things like that, where they make arbitrary choices that control your life over which you have absolutely no control. And then they pretend in the political re that they want to let everything go by. And I'm sitting there and saying, hang on, public safety is different than politics. You shouldn't have anyone, especially not the president of the United States, encouraging violence. And to, with these platforms allowing that to happen, they're essentially inviting a change in the most important law that protects them, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996. And I'm a big fan of Section 230. I like having a safe harbor because I think you want to encourage platforms to be thoughtful about protecting public safety and protecting, you know, the people who are disadvantaged. 
But that's not what they've done. They've treated it as an excuse to do absolutely nothing. And I think that's irresponsible. You called Roger in an op-ed for some changes, though, to Section 230, as well as national legislation that would give users the right to sue for damages if they're harmed as a result of using an Internet yeah. platform. I know that you've been talking to folks in Washington about this. What's the reaction from lawmakers? So, Emily, as we both know, three months ago, Section 230 was the third rail of technology policy. It's the one untouchable piece because everybody understands that it's really good for the entrepreneurial economy, for stimulating innovation. The issue that we're dealing with here is that the largest internet platforms are, through their neglect, allowing awful things to happen, allowing their platforms to be used to undermine public health, democracy, privacy, and competition. And Section 230 is the most direct, most rapid way of changing things. What I want to do is very specifically change incentives. I don't want to penalize them. I just want to sit there and say, listen, if you are above a certain scale and you are using algorithms to amplify speech, so if you're treating some forms of speech better than others, simply because it's good for your PL, under that circumstance, you are subject to litigation if someone is harmed. So Section 2 to 30 would apply to anything you do that's not amplified. And Section 230 would still provide protection if you can make a good argument that there was no harm. But you have to give citizens some path to recover damages when they get harmed. Because it's not like there are five people getting harmed. There are literally millions of people being harmed. I mean, more than 2 million people have COVID in the United States, which is a number of had it. That's a number that is so out of proportion to every other country. And that is because the disinformation about a pandemic that has caused our response to it to be just horrific. And, you know, I look at this and I go, the country's paralyzed today because Internet platforms give disproportionate political power to the most extreme voices. And that's a business choice on their part. And Emily, think about this. It's like the chemical companies in the 50s. They were the Internet stocks of the 50s super high profit margin, super high growth, because they could pour their waste products anywhere without penalty. They could dump toxic fumes into the air, pour mercury into fresh water, and there was no penalty. And eventually the country said, you know what? We're gonna make the people who caused the harm pay the price. And that's all I wanna to do to internet giants. I wanna say, guys, you're too important to the economy to be able to destroy it. So we're gonna make you be just the way chemical companies are, the way pharmaceutical companies are, the way the building trades are, which is you've got to act responsibly or you're going to pay the cost. Now, Roger, what's your take on Chris Cox, the former chief product officer and yeah. one of Mark Zuckerberg's top lieutenants who left because of a disagreement with Mark Zuckerberg about the future of the platform, now coming back to the company in the middle of all this in his old role? Emily, I am as confused as anyone about this. I don't know Chris well. Uh, what I do know was that he was the Zuck whisperer when he was there. He was the heir apparent. And when he left, that was a huge deal. And he left over a matter of what appeared to be a matter of principle, right? It was, it was had to do with the strategic direction, the whole treatment of, you know, the subsidiaries that they had acquired. None of that was resolved, right? All of it has con had continued down the path that was the one he objected to. And yet here he is coming back. And he obviously has full information on what's going on. So I really do not understand this. And I'm wondering, let me put it this way. I can't think of a good explanation for this that makes me feel better about what's going on. And there may be one. I just can't think of it. And, you know, Chris is a very capable person. But he's also somebody who has historically amplified and uh, helped to implement the messages that Mark Zuckerberg has created to, to drive Facebook forward. He's been able to translate Zuck's vision into products. And a year's gone by, I suspect those are still his best skills. And so I don't see him coming in in order to reform the company or change its business model. It looks more like he's coming in to double down on the things that they do well. And that really saddens me because Facebook, it's a great product, right? People love to use it. It doesn't need to do all this harm. Roger, you were one of the first people, perhaps the first person, to warn that 
Facebook could potentially undermine the presidential election in 2016 before it even happened. How concerned are you that Facebook and social networks will undermine the election that we, will, we are about to have? So the answer is I'm terrified. And I'm terrified because the Democratic primary was, with almost no journalistic investigation, significantly affected by disinformation. And we already know there's going to be a ton because there's a lot going on right now. And the president and his administration are untroubled by that. So from a regulatory point of view, there's no pressure on the platforms to clean that up from anybody who has the power to actually do something. All of it is coming from, you know, moral authorities. So the opposition party, journalists, and people like me. Here's the thing. If I'm Facebook, and I've just brought back Chris Cox, the reality is if Facebook wanted to change direction, if it wanted to reform its business model, Chris is the guy to do that. But why wouldn't they have said that was what their plan was when he came back? So I'm really, really terrified. And, uh, you know, my biggest thing is to try to inoculate everybody, to explain that, listen, November 3rd is election day. You got to vote. Get an absentee ballot. Go and vote. Be prepared to stand in line. Everyone has to participate. There's going to be a ton of disinformation to try to convince you not to vote. Pay no attention to it. This is the one where we all have to show up. This is where, if you're an American, you have to vote. And, you know, vote for whomever you choose. But this is the year everybody has to vote. Speaking of inoculation, as we've been speaking, a uh, headline just crossed that Brazil is now second uh, in COVID-19 deaths behind the United States, now passing uh, the United Kingdom. This is a big question, but what do you think the mark uh, is going to be of this pandemic on Silicon Valley? You've been here for, for, for decades. Um, we've seen companies laying off large chunks of their workforce. We're seeing work yeah. habits potentially change forever. Um, what is the the the, the mark, uh, the so legacy Emily, of COVID nineteen yeah. going to be on Silicon Valley? So Emily, one of the things we should really congratulate Silicon Valley on was having been early. I think nationwide, if you wanted to pick which group recognized the importance of social distancing first, it was the employers of Silicon Valley who were there roughly a week before the Bay Area counties went to lockdown. So, you know, Apple and Google and Facebook and all sent their employees home at least a week before that. That was incredibly positive. I think the really big question is whether coming out of this, coming off of the election, there's going to be significant regulation of the dominant players on the Internet. Because if there is, that will unleash a massive wave of innovation because the business model these guys have really makes it hard for any new startup to get past a certain stage. I mean, every once in a while, one will sneak through the way Zoom did, but it doesn't happen nearly often enough. And if there is regulation, that will be fantastic for the entrepreneurial economy. If there isn't regulation, if Trump wins and things go on more or less the way they are, I think Silicon Valley is gonna have a really serious problem. So the irony of this thing is that the better things are for the biggest market cap companies, the harder it'll be for the Valley and vice versa. And I don't think we know the answer to that question yet, which is why November 3rd is so important, because whether we like it or not, politics is going to have a huge impact in what our investment opportunity is from here. And I look at the technology that's there and say, if we started to pursue the opportunities to empower people, that would be huge. Because right now, the last 10 years, all those business models are predatory. And I'm talking here about whether it's it's Uber and Lyft being predatory towards employees or, uh, you know, the kinds of weird things that would happen on an Airbnb or in a WeWork, uh, you know, Spotify relative to musical artists. The culture really was about exploiting weakness and exploiting information advantages. But it doesn't have to be that way. Technology has the ability to empower everybody. And going through the moment we're going through here, I believe that there will be massive pent up demand for a different model of technology business. And that would be the coolest thing ever because it's the pieces are there. They've just never been applied to empowering technology, at least not since the days of Steve Jobs. And uh, you know, the last 10 or 12 years, it's been all about exploitation.
The question remains, how does Silicon Valley and tech companies use that power? Roger McNamee, I could sit here listening to you talk for hours. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time with us Emily, today. please uh, stay uh, well, okay? Soon. Stay well and thank you for including me because <laughs> I will you know, your audience is the most best. sophisticated audience out there. And so we really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Roger. While you help us make it great, uh, Roger McNamee, Elevation Partners, thank you so much for stopping by. Coming up, we're going to be talking about the markets. Markets today rebounding after the biggest dip in three months, but big risks remain. Laura Kane from UBS is with us next. This is Bloomberg. UBS is launching a new report on tech trends after COVID-19. Joining us now to discuss, uh, Laura Kane of UBS Wealth Management's Head of America's Thematic Investing, uh, joining us now on the phone. So, Laura, the big question is what trends stay, what trends go, what is the new normal when it comes for tech as we come out of the pandemic? What's your take on where the chips fall? Sure, Emily, and thanks again for having me on today. So, as we get past COVID-19, we believe that we're going to see technological forces play an outsized role in shaping the future economic landscape. And in a lot of ways, COVID-19 has actually served as an important catalyst and pushing us a little bit quicker toward this tech economy that we expected. And I would highlight three uh, key changes that we expect to see. So first, uh, we're going to be living increasingly digital lifestyles. Um, as we've seen during this pandemic, everything from working and learning to shopping and entertainment have shifted to the digital realm. So we think this is a trend that's going to stick with us. And during social distancing measures, we actually saw mobile app usage rise somewhere on the order of 20 to 30 percent, depending on what region of the world that you're in. The second trend I would highlight is we expect to see labor market disruption as new technologies unfold. So roughly 10 to 15 percent of jobs may be lost due to technology. But importantly, there will be new jobs that are created, but the new jobs won't necessarily uh, be, be acquired by those that lost their jobs due to technology. So there's just going to be this period of skills mismatch. And we believe that this is going to require um, advances in online learning to help bridge that gap uh, in skills that we're going to face in the future. And then the third area I'd highlight is more localized production. So for decades, we've talked about uh, globalization. So we're going to see some reversal of that trend. And what we're seeing is that advances in automation and robotics have made it cost effective to bring manufacturing closer to home. And the pandemic has actually made it more attractive to do so. So uh, we think this trend of uh, actually deglobalization is going to stick with us once we get past the virus. So net net, Laura, will there be more jobs uh, rather than less as we come out of it or will we lose jobs net net? So I think there are certain lower skill jobs that are uh, going to be lost. But I think the important thing to focus on is really how we're going to address that skills mismatch in the short term. So we're going to have this kind of labor market friction. And what, what we see a lot of uh, promising opportunities is in the online learning segment, because that has the potential to really increase accessibility and affordability of um, education. Because a lot of where we're going to see that job loss is in emerging markets, where we have a higher proportion of lower skilled labor. So education is really going to be the key to helping to offset some of those losses and make sure that uh, workers have the skills that are needed for the jobs of the future. All right. Laura Kane of UBS Wealth Management. Laura, thanks so much for joining us. We'll be following that report as you continue to build it out. All right. Coming up, a former Uber executive who left in a storm of controversy is speaking out, saying Uber made a big mistake losing that Grubhub deal. Emil Michael joins us next. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Shares of Just Eat Takeaway have plunged since announcing it plans to buy Grubhub in an all-stock deal for $7.3 billion, bringing the European food delivery company into the brutally competitive U.S. market. Uber had been in talks to buy Grub, but it didn't happen. Uber shareholder and former chief business officer Emil Michael says Uber made a massive strategic failure in not trying to own U.S. food delivery earlier. He joins us now in an exclusive interview. Emil, good to have you back on Bloomberg. It's been a little while. Um, you posted a lengthy tweet storm with some very pointed criticism. How badly do you think Uber needed this? And what position is Uber in now that they didn't get it? Um, well, uh, Uber needed it because what they, they missed uh, really badly by letting go of their lead position in food delivery in 2018 and 19. When, when uh, we'd left, when I'd left Uber in 2017, Uber was firmly in the lead ahead of DoorDash and everyone else in food delivery. And that lead was, was lost in 2018, 19, which led uh, to where they were today, which meant they needed potentially uh, the Grubhub asset to regain that lead. So when they uh, lost that to Just Eats yesterday, that meant that with DoorDash really double Uber's market share, Uber Eats' market share in the U.S., and now Grubhub being an asset owned by Just Eats, um, that became sort of problematic, meaning that Uber really has uh, nowhere to go uh, to get that lead position back in the U.S. anymore. Now, that said, doesn't Uber have bigger problems right now? I mean, ridership has plummeted as much as 80 percent. They've laid off large chunks of the company. There could be more layoffs to come. And even you acknowledge that Grubhub isn't the ideal asset, has antiquated technology. Why take on another potential problem? Well, I think the thing uh, that makes me bullish about Uber is I do think rides are going to come back uh, and they'll come back uh, quickly. And, and here's why. I do think there'll be a substitution from mass transit, where there's lots of crowds, into Ubers. Uh, there might be some substitution from Ubers and rideshare into private vehicles where people want to be uh, not around anyone, not even another driver. But I do think there'll be more substitution from mass transit into Ubers. Um, and then where Uber gets its strength, and this is a strength above and beyond Lyft, is having a platform where you have drivers that could drive both people in terms of rideshare and food and potentially groceries and other things. Um, and that's where the Uber platform gets really strong. And so if Uber's food delivery network is really strong and the rideshare network is really strong, that's the power of the Uber platform. So strengthening that with Grubhub, I think, was a smart, smart thing to do. And that's why I think Dara was going after that asset. Now, you said in your tweet storm, you say losing this deal will likely cause structural weakness in U.S. food delivery for all players for years to come. The best outcome is to hope for a future merger with DoorDash. And you say that Tony Hsu, the CEO of DoorDash, should become the CEO of the combined company. Why and why not Dara? Well, I said he would be the heir apparent, meaning, you know, every company of Uber's size has to do succession planning. And... Uh, I'd say that, you know, one of the things that always stop mergers from happening is what they call social issues, which means who's going to run the combined company. So, so I think uh, the rumors had it when Uber and uh, DoorDash talked over the last couple of years about should they combine, one of the issues as well was who's going to run the company, who's going to run the food division, and so on. So my proposal or my thought was that if they were to merge these two companies, that the heir apparent, meaning you know, after Dara had decided to, to retire, as I'm sure he wants to do someday, that, that Tony could maybe look at running both parts of the business, the ride share and the, uh, and the food delivery, because he's a, he's a founder of that company. And I think founder-like companies tend to do better over time, in tech especially. Okay, but the takeaway from Retreat Storm is that it sounds like you don't think um, Uber is doing the right things right now. And it sounds like you're, 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 you're criticizing the, the way that Dara is leading the company. I mean, did I get the wrong impression? Well, I did, I, how, Dara, how do you think Dara is doing? Uh, I think he's done a lot of things really well. He is, um, you know, and, and things he's done better than, than what I and some of the management team before did. He's, he's proven to be a great diplomat. Um, he's proven to sort of bring calm to the storm in a lot of ways. Um, 
that uh, that we didn't do. So I think he's done some very good things on that. He's taken the company public, so lots of good things. Um, on the other side, you have the stock price. And the stock price is ultimately the ultimate measure of, you know, is value being added to the company? And I think SoftBank, when they invested in January of 18, they invested about $33 a share. Today, the stock price is about $32 a share. Um, the last time I sold stock to an investor was about $47 a share. So I think every shareholder, Dara included, myself, others want to get back toward $47 a share and beyond. So I think ultimately that is going to be the measure of is this management team successful? And I want them to be successful more than anybody um, because I'm still a large shareholder and have most of the shares that I've ever held in, in Uber still in Uber shares. Now, that said, you left Uber in a storm of controversy three years ago. I know you've admitted that you've made some mistakes. There was the going to a strip club with employees. There was, you know, the, 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 you know what, what's, what some employees called it, a toxic culture created at the company. How do you reflect on that? And what do you say to the folks who might be thinking, why should we listen to you? Well, I mean, I think that... Um, People can have their different views on on the culture. It was, you know, there was a lot of amazing things that came out of Uber. Um, and I think even Dara has said that no one could have created the business that we created in such a short time frame with, with the ambition that we did. And there was a lot of things that were great about that. And, um, and you know, I think those things are things I won't, I, no one, I don't want to apologize for at the moment. But that, that being said, there was mistakes that I made, that we made, and and I would counsel all the entrepreneurs I work with today not to make. Um, every business makes them. You look across the landscape today and you say, what could any business do better? And I think those are things to, to learn. In terms of, um, you know, why should anyone listen? It's like, who do you listen to today except people who've succeeded and, and failed at certain things and have lessons to draw on those on those experiences. I mean, I was a acolyte of uh, Bill Campbell, the trillion dollar coach. And some of the things he taught me were, were learn from uh, the mistakes you made and learn from the successes and pay, pay those things forward. And that's what I've been doing. And hopefully I can do that to other entrepreneurs going forward as well. Do you think Travis, uh, Travis would be doing a better job than Dara is if he was still the CEO? I mean, there's no doubt that had we gotten past the challenges in 2017, that um, that I believe that founder-led companies um, that have a long-term perspective uh, that are run really by technical founders that have engineering mentalities um, end up doing better. So I, I believe that, and that's why I joined that company and partnered with him. Um, so I, you know, I believe that, and I think even. You know, Bill Gurley, who was one of the, the architects of the ouster, um, said that ideally you want the founders to go all the way. Um, so, I, you know, I think most people would say that that would be the ideal outcome and the company would have been better off had that been the case, had we gotten through the troubles of that year. You were, you've been critical about how Uber has handled the deal making process. And I wonder, looking back, you could have bought Lyft. There was a time when that could have happened. Yep. Was that a mistake? That was a mistake, for sure. Um, I think, uh, and that is, again, another lesson uh, I give to entrepreneurs who are in highly competitive environments, which is sometimes when you're in a dogfight with, with another company, um, and it might be sometimes the better answer is to merge with that company and join, join forces and to tackle a market together. And I think had Uber and Lyft done that um, earlier, that would have been a, a really smart decision. Um, and I think anyone who was involved at the time, and we still talk about that, some more stories with people who were involved at the time, I think, or to a person, we all say that would have been the smart move. Meantime, a number of the places that you and, and, and Travis uh, took the company into a number of countries, these are markets that Uber has now retreated from. And I wonder if you moved too fast and if Uber just was never meant to be as big a company as you and Travis thought it could be. Um, and if that's just the way it is now. I mean, you know, it's funny, they would use the word retreat, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick that bone for a second, which is 
when you go into China and you end up owning 20% of DD, or you go into Russia and you own nearly 30% of the Yandex taxi, or you go into uh, Southeast Asia and you own 30% of Grab, and together the stakes in those companies end up being worth $15 billion, maybe more someday, that retreat that's worth $15 billion ends up being pretty worth it. Um, so those stakes in those companies alone are worth more than Lyft's entire market cap. So I would say that those ventures were completely worth it. And I'd say that had we still been there running the company, you know, we might have also been in, in grocery delivery. Uh, we probably still would have been leading in food delivery in the U.S. Um, and lots of other things. I think the ambition that comes with being a founder-like company would have far extended beyond where, where Uber is today. And, uh, and the deals we did back then um, led to lots of value creation. Now, from a cultural perspective, a lot has changed. There's been a whole Me Too movement. Um, we're in the middle of this social crisis right now, you know, protesters in the streets. As you look back, what would you do differently if you could? Well, I'd say that you know Uber, Uber, in a lot of ways, was on the front end of a lot of uh, the social movements. Um, in that, in two thousand, you remember, two thousand seventeen was the first year of the Trump administration, and a lot of activism had started uh, during that year. In fact, part of part of the first uh, crisis of that year was the, the lead Uber campaign, which which happened around the Trump Business Council, which sort of this inadvertent. Uh, minefield that that Uber had stepped in, um, and you know I think what you learn is that, and what I've learned in the last few years is that politics and business are more intertwined than they've ever been. Um, and it used there was a time maybe a while ago where you could be a leader of a company and sort of focus really on what's happening in the business and the business alone, and not really think about what's happening in the outside world. And those days are over. That does not work. Um, and then secondarily, um, what's happening in the outside world and uh, in terms of, of being a part of the community that you're in and making sure you have a diverse workforce and you're thinking about um, adding to your community and being a per part of lifting it up, every part of that community, for women, for people of color and so on, those days of not having that be a core ethos to your companies, those days are over too. So any company today from the beginning of the founding needs to be thinking about those issues. Um, and that's just the way of the world these days. All right, Emil Michael, Uber shareholder, former chief business officer. Emil, thank you so much for stopping by and talking Good with to us talk today. To Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, coming up, as people emerge from quarantine, bikes are playing a central role in getting the workforce moving again, and electric bikes in particular are in demand. We're gonna to speak to the CEO of Rad Power Bikes next. This is Bloomberg. With COVID-19 cases surging in different parts of the world, social distancing may be here for the long haul. And socially distant commuting may be as well. Enter Seattle-based Rad Power Bikes, a company whose sales in April were up almost 300% over the same month last year. Founder and CEO Mike Radenbaugh joins us now. And Mike, as I understand it, you built your first e-bike when you were in high school as a way to get to school and back. Talk to us about ma what makes your bikes uh, different from the competition. Yeah, th thanks so much for having me. Uh, huge fan ears and, and excited to speak with you today. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, you know, I grew up building stuff and working on solar installations out in rural uh, Northern California. The, the company's now based in Seattle, Washington. And uh, so I started building e-bikes at the age of 15. You know, 13 years later, we have a really robust lineup of electric bikes and some of our kind of key differentiators as a business has really been our focus on research and development, supply chain leadership, and really kind of our business model being first of its kind of pure play uh, direct to consumer uh, model. So what trends has the pandemic uh, revealed for you and what of those trends do you believe stay as we come out of this? 
Yeah, the, the pandemic is it's really proving that e-bikes really are essential to even a wider audience of people. And, you know, people that are going stir crazy or have more time on their hands or maybe even craving opportunities to, you know, get outside. Uh, and But I think an even bigger piece that's, that's happened here is just people's concern around using public transit and wanting uh, a, a, a social distance mobility solution. And really on the, on the back side of this thing, we really see this as kind of a light switch that flipped that isn't going to flip, flip back. And, and so we're seeing really continued demand surge, even as, uh, as regions come back online and out of, out of uh, shutdown. Now, uh, you know, meantime, you have other companies like Uber, for example, getting out of, of electric bikes and, and, and scooters and finding it just not very profitable. How does your model differ from that? Yeah, our mission as a business is around really offering kind of an unrivaled customer experience, but it's about our bikes that are built for everything and priced for everyone. So in a moment like this where you have a lot of new people entering a category, you want two things. One is a really nice, you know, entry price that seems like a good value to people that are new to, to e-biking. And, and, and number two is a distribution model that can, you know, get a bike to a customer's doorstep, which is which is how we distribute most of our products is direct to doorstep. Um, and, and so that's, I think that's the big piece here for our business is that people are able to kind of take back their own mobility rather than rely on a service provider that is challenged during these times. It's very hard to run a, a fleet of e-bikes in a public space during a, you know, a worldwide pandemic, of course. So, you know, what are you planning for uh, through the end of the year? There is so much uncertainty. You know, people still are, are working from home. And when do you see sort of a new burst in demand, you know, as things start to normalize? Yeah, so not only the, you know, the exponential sales that we've experienced, they're, they're continuing. And so it's causing our, us to really look at our business and and uh, ensure that we can build an even more robust, for example, customer service team, an even more robust uh, and diversified supply chain. And, and, and so we were already leading in that space as sort of a key differentiator of our business was always a, a first mover advantage was heavy investment into supply chain and customer service. But even, even with that initial investment, we're still just seeing totally unexpected this expected demand. So our response to this is really to um, to ramp. It's to ramp across the business, across our organization to try to keep up. And we feel very fortunate to be in that position um, versus what so many you know, companies are facing right now. And so we're really proud and, and, and compelled to you know, push, push hard right now because the people are speaking and, and we're listening for sure. Meantime, bikes have been back ordered for, for some time. Quickly, what are you doing to expand production more quickly? Yeah, we well. First off, we we front loaded a lot of inventory ahead of Chinese New Year, and our our bikes are now you know they're built across a number of countries, and and, um, and so we we had a very diverse manufacturing you know partners uh, supply chain coming into this. So we, we were set up well, but uh, regardless, it was it was it was not sat sufficient to to uh, you know. Uh, you know, take, take care of like I think the numbers that, that we shared with you in that in the Bloomberg Green piece are around 297% you know, growth April over April, and so that's a totally unprecedented right. surge in demand has has uh, resulted in us going even wider. So, more diverse manufacturing uh, group, uh, you know, just minimizing the dependence on you know one region especially has been has been a big piece of it. But even transportation, right, where even domestically like. FedEx, UPS, you know, carriers are, you know, they're, they're, they're at peak demand right now. And you're seeing that across, you know, internet sales where fulfillment times are slower than normal. Now more than ever, uh, we talk about the direct care workers uh, here in the U.S. that are impacting the lives of older adults and also the healthcare broader ecosystem and the need for us to support folks as they're triaging from COVID. Um, so Care Academy is actually the enabler, the, the uh, 
force that will help folks come into healthcare and uh, be able to provide for um, healthcare needs of those who are uh, impacted by COVID. So we provide online professional development uh, for direct care workers through our platform. Uh, and we've enabled 110,000 workers already and have a commitment over the next three years to helping a million people enter into healthcare work. Now, COVID-19 has taken a huge toll on nursing homes, on the elderly population. What more urgent needs are you seeing as a result of the pandemic? Before the pandemic, we already saw that there was a huge shortage of direct care workers. And now the long and short of healthcare is increasingly in home, right? Um, we're seeing a number of folks recover from COVID inside the home care space. And because so many folks have been impacted within nursing homes, families are starting to ask the question, where is it best to recover? Um, now, it's worth mentioning, everyone can't recover at home, but we can do a much better job as a country in making sure that people can access healthcare within the home care space. Meantime, we're not just facing a health crisis, but an economic crisis and a social crisis, a racism pandemic, if you will. As a Black female founder, what are your thoughts on this? How have you been following this? How have you been experiencing this? So home care for many reasons. I've been a direct care worker. I've been an educator. Um, is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think that just as COVID has re re just revealed um, the you know huge amounts of resources as well as inaccessibility of people of color who are suffering disproportionately from COVID as well as older adults, um, therein lies the opportunity. Um, I am building a company alongside our team of something that relates to my experiences and so I think it's a catch it's an opportunity for America to realize the great inequalities and the vast inaccessibility that that happens and and has occurred and then a great opportunity in the same breath um, to reimagine a future where we include more people of color including myself as a founder of color uh, to create things that can vastly impact um, a lot of the inequalities that we are seeing today so I see it as a huge challenge it's a huge uh, moment of clarity and also a huge opportunity in this in this uh, in, in the midst of COVID and also um, the racial strife and injustice that we're seeing. The amount of venture capital funding that goes to Black founders is minuscule, and we've seen some venture capital firms like um, SoftBank, Entries, and Horowitz commit uh, to fund more Black founders, Black communities. You know, there's been some controversy around this. We spoke to an investor, Monique Woodward, who thinks Black founders don't need a separate water fountain. What do you think? I absolutely agree with Monique, and, and Monique is someone that we follow, um, you know, quite readily um, because of exactly that same sentiment. Um, it's worthwhile mentioning that Care Academy um, was part of the deal flow of companies who have, you know, an orientation around traditional venture capital to provide a return, right? And it's fundamentally, I think, VCs can take shape of this moment and step back. Um, companies founded by diverse perspectives and diverse founders can have a huge impact in the country, right? Um, our, by and large, we have 1,000 customers um, and home care agencies that we ser service as a B2B company. Um, and, you know, this company is run by two women of color. Um, and so I completely agree that part of the larger thinking and the opportunity is to think big. That's the job of venture. That's the job of, of innovation is to think bigger. And I think we can think much bigger and much broadly in terms of um, how we create access for uh, founders of color and diverse founders. Part of my conversation there with Helen Adeosin, co-founder and CEO of Care Academy, which just announced a new funding round. She talked about the trends that she is seeing across the home care business in the midst of the pandemic, which has created urgent need uh, for better options um, for senior and elderly care. It's a company we're definitely going to continue to follow. And that does it for this Friday edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Wall Street Week is next. Stay tuned for that. This is Bloomberg.